All right, good morning. This is Pastor Sam Gerhard with the Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries here in the big South Fork of Jamestown, Tennessee. And uh, we're here gathered uh, in our gathering place with uh, folks who are in front of me and those of you who will be joining us by Facebook Live or later through the YouTube. But we're grateful for all of you that are here. And it's always, uh, it's always easier for the preacher if he's preaching to more than one or two. And uh, I'm going to come and I'm going to preach even if there's only one or two. But it sure is encouraging when there's more than one or two. And uh, so that's always a help to get the feedback and the, having the faces in front of you. Uh, but it's about just getting out the truth of the word and sharing the ministry and sharing the gospel. And that's what we want to be busy about doing. All right, if you will, this morning, two main places I want you to find in your Bible. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5. So if you want to find 1 Corinthians 2 and uh, Hebrews chapter 5, then that would be great. And because those would be our two primary texts today as we consider the subject that we have at hand. Uh, the morning, This morning's message is titled, Three Men and a Baby. Uh, when I put the post up on Facebook, I went and found the promotion for that movie from Lord knows how many years ago it was, probably the 70s, I guess, when... That movie came out with Ted Danson and, and uh, Tom Selleck, and I can't remember who the other guy was. Uh, but The Three Men and a Baby. And it was a cute, you know, funny comedy, like probably one of those romantic comedies, whatever they're called. Uh, but I thought that that title fits where we're going today because we're going to talk in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, especially in, in the beginning of chapter 3. We're going to talk about three men and a baby. And so hence the title. And so let's begin reading. We're going to read all of chapter 2 and then the first three verses of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> and then we'll go over to Hebrews 5. So Paul again writing here, 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the found before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that ye might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Continuing on chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For where is there is among you envying and strife and divisions? Are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now as you've read through there, verse 14, 15, 16 of chapter 2, and then 1, 2, 3 of chapter 3, 
you ought to be able to identify the three men and the baby. There's the carnal man. There's, or excuse me, there's the natural man. There's the spiritual man. There's the carnal man. And then there's the babe in Christ. And so that's our three men and a baby that we're going to talk about today. And so holding your place in 1 Corinthians 2, because that's where we'll spend most of our time, go with me, if you will, back to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And let's read verses 8 through 14 in Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, speaking of Jesus Christ, you see the capital S there. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And so whoever the writer of Hebrews is, to this audience that he's writing, these Hebrews to whom he's writing, uh, they're a whole lot like those Corinthians were. He says there, uh, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. It's funny how the Bible puts those things in such a delicate way. But we know what they mean. And it goes on now, and it gets a little more pointed, verse 12 through the end of the chapter, 12, 13, 14 of Hebrews 5. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So again, if you'll go with me back to 1 Corinthians 2, uh, we're going to begin to unwrap some information about these three men and the baby. And as we do this, of course, then the evaluation is, as we preach the message, whether you're sitting here in front of me now or whether you're listening through the YouTube or the Facebook Live message, whichever way, uh, as we consider these, then, you know, we have to examine ourselves. Uh, where do I fit in this category of being a natural man or a spiritual man or a carnal man or a babe? And of course, you know, ladies, as we use the term man, we're talking about humankind and uh, soul, all right? I just haven't gotten to the place where I'm able to say a natural person. Uh, I'm going to say what the Bible says here, and, and you know what the what it means, all right? So we're good to go there. All right, I'm too old to start changing my pronouns now. <laughs> all right, uh, there you go. All right, verse 14. He says, but the natural man... Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto them, ne unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. And so, when we consider the natural man, the first of our three men and a baby, the natural man is the lost man. The natural man, woman, boy, girl, that's the lost person. That's the person that's never had that moment in time. They've never had that 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 place, that point where they heard the gospel how that Christ died on that cross for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for their justification. They've never heard that gospel, that salvation is by grace through faith and the finished work of Christ, plus nothing and minus nothing. They've never heard that gospel, or if they have heard it, they've not responded to it. And so the person heard, believed, understood, and trusted in what Jesus did on their behalf for their eternal salvation. That's the lost person. Now, as we say the lost person, then our minds tend to think about, uh, you know, the unchurched, uh, the people who are, you know, we would think of as being away from God. And, uh, and certainly, you know, as you think about those folks, uh, many of those people are lost people, uh, never heard the gospel, never responded, maybe never been to church of any kind, never heard the gospel, never been saved, have no interest in spiritual things whatsoever, have no interest in church, have no interest in the Word of God, have no interest in anything along those lines. 
And so that's the kind of person we typically think about, a lost person. But I want us to be very much aware when we think about the lost person, we're not just talking about the depraved and the indifferent to spiritual things or biblical things, but we're also talking about the religious lost. You've heard me say so many times, most people in the pew are ignorant of the word of God. And that's just the truth of it. And you've heard me say so many times that uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of people who go to hell from a church pew and go to heaven from a bar stool. And so while they're the natural man is the lost person, the person who has not come to faith in Christ alone for their salvation, whether they're in the depths of the gutters, whether they're involved in the depravity of all that we see in this present evil world, or whether they're sitting on the front row with a King James Bible, a white shirt and a tie and a dress, singing the hymns that they've been singing all their life. Either one, if they're trusting, if, if they've never trusted anything for salvation, or if they're trusting their religion for salvation, they're lost. And so when we talk about the natural man, don't think about the guy hanging out at the drug corner or the honky-tonk. Don't, don't just think about them because some of those folks are saved. Don't think about and don't fail to think about the person sitting in a church pew that's a good neighbor, that treats people nice. You ever thought about that? I mean, there's a lot of those good church folks. They make great neighbors. They got to mow their grass. They got to be nice. Because if they don't, they'll have to hit the altar. And if they don't make it to the altar in time, they'll die in their sin and go to hell. Isn't that an awful way to live? So the natural man is the lost man. And notice what it says about the lost man in verse 14. The natural man. First of all, it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. You go to that lost person in the gutter. You go to that lost person living the depths of depravity. And even if they realize they're sinners, how many times do they think to themselves? Maybe how many times have we thought? Maybe some of you out there listening, you've thought to yourself, I am too far gone. I have sinned too long. I have committed too great a death. There's no way that, a, that God in heaven could ever accept me. Well, that brings me back to my favorite verse in Scripture, Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They, they don't want to hear, or if they do hear, they don't believe that God would save them. And there's a whole lot of things we could go on and on with that idea. But there's the idea of that depraved, that out of church, that unchurched, lost man, natural man, and then that religious natural man, that religious lost man who receives not the things of the Spirit of God, that's the guy that you tell him from the truth of the Word of God that again, salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing and minus nothing. That religious guy that says, oh man, uh, oh yeah, salvation is by grace, Jesus did it all, but if you don't live right, you're going to hell. That's a natural man who receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Because the, the truth of the Spirit of God, the salvation is all by grace, it's all by the work of Christ. We cannot do anything to add anything to what Jesus did. To say that I have to do something, to say that you have to do something, for some religious person to think that they have to do something or that they can do something, to add to, to secure, to maintain their salvation, what they're saying is what Jesus did wasn't enough. The religious world out there, you can read and study about the different religious denominations, major, major uh, Christian religions and whatever title you want to put out there. You go out there and you start reading their definition of grace and most of the time their definition of grace is and you, you know, when you say we're saved by grace through faith, you can quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Those folks will quote that, and then they'll tell you, here's what that means. That means you believe on Jesus, and you're supposed to do everything you can do, 
and what you can't quite get accomplished, Jesus will take up your slack. Folks, that's a false gospel. That's a perverted gospel. And the folks that are in the religious world, the natural man who's in that religious world, they receive not the things of the Spirit of God. Again, they tell you, you've got to do something. You've got to quit sinning. You know, I always follow that up with, as if you could. <laughs> you know, I mean, my mind just goes there. But, but isn't that what we've been told? you got to quit sinning. And you try your best to quit sinning. Steve Atwood tells the story about a man that he was witnessing to, and, and, uh, and, and he was trying to bring the man to a saving faith in Christ. And the man said, said I, I want to be saved. But, and he touched his pocket. And he said, but, he said, but, he said, I, I can't give these up. He had that pack of cigarettes in his pocket. He said, I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. But I just can't give these up. And the point was that the guy had been taught in the religious circles that he had been traveling in that he couldn't be saved until he gave up his cigarettes. You got to quit sinning. You got to quit doing this, quit doing that. Well, again, that's the, that's the natural man not receiving the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man, the religious natural man who receives not the things of the Spirit of God, they tell you, you've got to be water baptized to be saved. You've got to be a member of a certain church to be saved. You've got to partake of the Eucharist to be saved. You've got to do, and, and whatever list, you know, you've got to do to be saved. Folks, that's the natural man who receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. I don't care how religious he is. I don't how clean living he is. I don't matter how, care how good a neighbor he is. All right, the natural man once receives not the things of the Spirit of God. And it says, for they are foolishness unto him. If you ever talk to somebody who, who believes you have to be water baptized to be saved, and you tell them, no, water has nothing to do with your salvation, you don't have to get wet in any way, shape, or form for salvation in any way, and you go tell somebody that, and when you do, that person who believes, who's been indoctrinated, who has not been taught how to rightly divide the word of truth, who have been taught a false gospel, that person will argue with you tooth and nail and they'll walk away shaking their heads calling you a fool because you're preaching the truth of the gospel. They won't receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto them. You mean to tell me Jesus will save you? Jesus will save me? Jesus will save that homosexual? Jesus will save that pervert? Jesus will say that immoral. Jesus will say that adulterer. Jesus will say that drug addict. Jesus will say that alcoholic. Jesus will say whatever. And all they have to do is trust Christ? Yeah, that's the gospel. No, that's foolishness. See, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. They think that's foolish. Right within our context, just look across the page, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And just by the way, I'm teaching on baptism uh, and the different kinds of baptism in the Bible. We're doing that on Tuesday nights. and uh, But just let me point out right there, as a side note, okay, uh, nobody but Paul could say what he said in verse 17. I mean, as far as apostles. Peter, James, and John could never say what Paul said in verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because indeed, Peter, James, and John were all told to baptize. Paul said, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Well, let's carry on. That's, that's another message. Come on Tuesday nights. We'll meet here at 6 o'clock. All right. Okay. All right. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. The preaching of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But after that, in the wisdom of God, by the, uh, the excuse me, but af for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now again, that's, that's foolish. That's not God's wisdom, right? All right, verse, verse 20. Or verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And I'll stop there for our reading for this time. Look at chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Look at verse 18, 19, and 20 of chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. 18, 19, 20. Paul says there, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. And so when we go back now, we're still talking about this natural man of chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, uh, because for they are foolishness unto him. You start talking about spiritual things, they're foolishness unto him. That depraved person out there that has no... You, you start talking about the thing they have no interest. It's foolishness unto them. You take uh, the, the, the university professor who has gotten such an intellect and gotten such an education that he doesn't even believe there's a God. See, all this is foolishness to him. And so the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness of the them. And it goes on and says, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So that natural man, that lost man, wherever he is, whatever his status in life, whatever her status in life, that natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God because those things are spiritually discerned. Look at verse 9 of chapter 2. Verse 9 of chapter 2. Paul's talking, this is kind of what Paul's talking about there in verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, and I'm going to say it like this, neither have entered into the heart of the carnal, of the, excuse me, of the natural man. For as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of the natural man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Does God love the natural man? Oh yeah. God commended his love toward us and while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Everybody quotes John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so we know that God loves him, but here's the natural man. His eye hasn't seen, his ear hasn't heard, neither is it into his heart. Those things which God has prepared. Look at verse 11. For, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. The things of God knoweth no natural man. Because those things come from the spirit of God. And so there we have a picture of the natural man, the lost man. However religious they might be, however depraved they might be, however, however educated they might be, that's the description of the natural man. And then we go to verse 15. As we go to verse 15, he begins to talk about the spiritual man. He says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 
For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so the, the spiritual man is the saved man who is spiritually maturing. The spiritual man is the individual who, again, at that, had a, at that moment in time, came to that place where they realized they were a sinner, could not save themselves, placed their faith in the finished work of Christ, and were gloriously saved completely and totally by the grace of God. And then, as that saved individual, they get in their Bible, they open their Bible, they begin to read, they begin to study, they begin to get into the Word of God and begin to, uh, to, to feed upon the Word of God and begin to grow in their understanding of Scripture and understanding of what God's doing. That's the spiritual man. Spiritual man is going to be contrasted against the carnal man when we get over there. So the spiritual man is a saved man that's spiritually maturing. It's a saved person that is growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You read through Paul's epistles and how many ten times does he talk about he wants folks to grow in grace, to be rooted and grounded and to grow and to mature. And we know that the only way to get mature and grounded and, and, uh, and to have an understanding of what's do, what God's doing, the only way to do that is in the book. And I don't mean just listening to me or someone else preach it and teach it. I mean get in the book yourself. As I said, most people in the pew are ignorant of the Word of God. And I usually add to that, and most preachers like it that way. And why do you say that, Brother Sam? Because whatever sign is out there on the front door, whatever sign's out there in the yard, you walk into that particular church, those people that walk into that church and sit in that pew, they're expecting to hear certain things. If I'm in this kind of church, I expect to hear this. If I'm in this kind of church, I expect to hear this. If I'm in this kind of church, I expect everything to be solemn and quiet. And if I spend this kind of church, I expect, Woo, glory to God, hallelujah, we're jumping pews. You know, there's things that we expect, we anticipate. And so we go in there anticipating those things which we've always heard and always been taught, but never studied Scripture for ourselves. We've never been like the Bereans of Acts 17, I think, verse 11, where, Paul said, where Luke writes about the Bereans in the book of Acts. He says, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And so when we talk about the spiritual man, that's the man who is saved by the grace of God and then begins to get into the word of God and read and study and mature and learn about what God's doing for himself, for themselves. That's very important. Notice it says that uh, about the spiritual man, it says there that he judgeth all things. What's that mean? That means he's discerning. Paul talks about prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Whatever you hear that's supposed to be from Scripture, whether you're listening to a radio or whether you're sitting in a church pew in front of some preacher or whether you're watching some preacher on television, wherever it is, with some YouTube video or some Facebook Live video, wherever it might be, you, you're to prove all things. You hear it, but then you go to the Scripture. Prove all things and then you hold fast that which is good. I talk about preachers being like fish dinners. You enjoy the fish, you set the bones on the side. Some fish are bonier than others. <laughs> Some fish are too bony to mess with. Right? I mean, if we can go get a good grouper filet, we can enjoy that. But if somebody puts some old bony carp on your plate, <laughs> uh, that's too bony to mess with. All right? So you have to be discerning. And discernment comes back to uh, being a spiritual man, spiritually maturing. maturing. You're reading, you're studying, you're, you're searching for truth of the Word of God. You're studying the Word of God the way He tells us to by rightly dividing the Word of truth. You're, under, you're coming to understand the difference between time past and but now and the ages to come. You learn and you become to understand the difference between prophecy and mystery and law and grace and Israel and the church, the body of Christ. 
the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Christ. You learn those differences and you begin to mature. And as you do that, then you're able to discern. We were talking Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, and, and y'all will hear me doing this when I do a message. I'll say, you know, turn in your Bible and I may give an Old Testament passage. And what I want you to do, click automatically. When I say go to an Old Testament passage, anywhere from Genesis through Malachi, and, and technically I could include Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? But while the division says New Testament, we understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still under Old Testament economy. All right? Without the death of the testator, as Hebrews talks about. So they're still Old Testament. So when I tell you to go to, to somewhere in Genesis through Malachi, in your mind there ought to be a discernment. He's going to give us a passage of scripture that we can use as an application, but I know that that scripture was written too far about the people of Israel. That's the reality. I can't go in there and claim some promise God made to Israel for myself if Paul doesn't repeat that promise for us today in the church of the body of Christ. That's discernment. When I go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I read in the red letters and the things that Jesus said, discernment is, I know because Jesus said so. Jesus said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus came in fulfillment of prophecy to forward about the people of Israel. And so when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, discernment is, I know that whatever's in there is Jesus teaching the people of Israel regarding the prophesied and promised coming kingdom. And I say it like this, Jesus wasn't talking to you and I as wild dog Gentiles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's discernment. And discernment is then when I see Jesus said one thing and then, and let me say it like this, Jesus said one thing in his earthly ministry to Israel in his life, in those, that three and a half years of his earthly ministry, and then let me say it like this, and then Jesus said something else from heaven to us through the Apostle Paul. Y'all with me? That's discernment. So when I read in the red letters, we did this message I think not long ago. If I read in the mess, if I read in the red letters where Jesus said, "You got to forgive in order to get forgiveness," and then Paul says, "You forgive because you've been forgiven," is that different? That's very different. <laughs> Jesus said, "If you don't forgive." Neither will my Father forgive you. The ascended Lord Jesus Christ, through the pen of our Apostle Paul, said, You already have forgiveness. I've forgiven you all trespasses. Christ died, I died for your sins. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing trespasses unto them. So when we talk about forgiveness, we know our forgiveness is a done deal. Jesus paid it all. I'm not worried about my sins being forgiven. They were forgiven 2,000 years ago when Jesus took those things upon himself on that cross on Calvary's hill. You see, that's discernment. So when Jesus told those people of Israel, you've got to forgive in order to get forgiveness, and Paul later on tells us, we forgive because we have been forgiven. That's discernment. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual, verse 15, judgeth all things. You're able to discern all things. When you mature and are growing in your grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and what he's doing. It says, yet he himself is judged of no man. In other words, what is it that judges us? What is it that, that who is it that we give an account to? I should say it like that. 
We give an account to the Lord, right? He says there, for uh, at the end of that, for he, yet he himself is judged of no man. That spiritual man that judge all things is not judged of anyone else. It's, we're not judged on what we think we ought to do. And we ought to be careful about that too. I don't judge someone based on whether they do or don't do the things that I think they ought to do or not do. He himself is judged no man. Why? It's because it's the scriptures that judge us. I don't have a right. I learned something a long time ago. <laughs> you know, young preachers, they're kind of programmed because of what they heard. Young preachers like to get up and boy, they like, they, and we use the term, they like to stomp on people's toes. Sometimes old preachers that don't learn better. You know what I learned a long time ago? I can get up and I can preach about drinking, smoking, cussing, chewing, whatever it is you want to put on the list. I can get up and preach about that and I can rail about those things and I can carry on about those things. But you know what? You're going to go do whatever you want to do. <laughs> right? And I've not helped you at all. Because if the Word of God cannot convict or draw or whatever about whatever it is in your life, that may or may not be pleasing to the Lord. And again, religion is not the one to determine that. It's the book who's the one to determine that. That's important for us to get. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4, right there. And I'm going to read the first four verses. There it is. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4. Paul says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required to stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Verse 4. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. And how is it again that the Lord judges us? He judges us through the scriptures. He corrects us through the scriptures. Go with me real quickly to Galatians chapter 1. Scroll there or just listen to me. Can't get there fast enough. Just one verse in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. Paul says in Galatians 1 10, For do I, for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul's saying, buddy, if I was... And boy, you read through the book of Galatians, he makes that real clear. The whole thing about the circumcision, the keeping of the law for righteousness all through the book of Galatians. And, and Paul said, if I yet preach circumcision, then the offense of the cross has ceased. Paul said, hey, I could go around and I could be preaching these Gentile believers and these believers who are saved by the gospel of Christ. I could go tell them they need to be circumcised and, uh, and keep the law of Moses to live a good, clean Christian life and uh, nobody would bother me at all. But because I tell them they're saved by grace through faith and circumcision adds nothing to it, then I suffer persecution. So he says there, Galatians 1.10, he says there, let me read it again. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So the spiritual man judges all things. The spiritual man is not judged of man, and the spiritual man has the mind of Christ. As you go on, verse 16, that he may instruct him. Video's messing up again. Okay, there we go. Last week I lost the last few minutes, and I had to come in and do it again. The I lost the audio, so I'm trying to watch that. What don't happen? All right, a little glitch there. So again, verse uh, 16, he says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I'll say it over and over again. The mind of Christ. We find the mind of Christ on the, in the pages of the written word of God. That's where we have the mind of Christ. You're going to leave. You're going to travel. You're going to leave your animals and you're going to have someone else come in, take care of your animals, come in, take care of your property. And you may choose to give them a list. Here's what I want you to do while I'm gone. We're going to be gone to East Fork, and somebody in the community is going to come and feed the horses 
that, uh, that we don't take with us and the dog we don't take with us. We're going to go down to Alabama next week, the weekend after, and we're going to have somebody come in and take care of those horses. And so they'll, they'll know the things that we need them to do. And so when we leave that list, those instructions, that information that we want them to have, we leave the instructions we want them to have while we're away. Y'all following the analogy? We have left them our mind regarding those things. Does that make sense? Jesus ascended. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. We're listening for the trumpet until the day he calls us up out of here. But between the moment we're saved and come to faith in Christ and the moment we hear that trumpet and we're called up to be with the Lord in the air, we have the mind of Christ. He's left us some instructions written down in the pages of this old black book. And then look at chapter 3, verse 2. Paul says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And so we kind of make by inference there, then not on, the spiritual man also, the spiritual man can feed on meat, the meat of the word. The natural man doesn't get it at all. The carnal man, he's still on Pablo. But the spiritual man can feed on meat. We were in Hebrews, and let me go back over there and read verse 14, Hebrews 5, 14. He says, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And where they get? They get that from the word of God, right? That all takes place by getting in the book. All right, there's the spiritual man. So we've talked about the natural man, the lost man. We've talked about the spiritual man. And, and let me say, by the way, a man can be spiritual I'm going to lose some of you on this. <laughs> a man can be spiritual and not darken the door of a conventional church house. Okay? If he knows the word of God, and he understands the truth of the word of God. And in so doing has discernment. And he goes to visit this church and he sits in the pew and he listens a little bit because he's a spiritual, he's a spiritual man. He's saved. He's growing. He's maturing in Christ. He's studying the word of God. He's understanding some things for himself. And he goes and sits in the pew and he hears a preacher preach something. And that guy sits there and he, no, oh, that's, that ain't right. And he says, okay, that's just one time. Let me go back again. And so he, you know, goes several times. And buddy, if you're hearing the gospel messed up, if you're, if you're being preached to out of the Old Testament that you've got to do this, that, and the other out of the Old Testament to be right with God, if you're preaching out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the preacher's primary messages come out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then that, that means he doesn't understand the earthly ministry of Christ and the heavenly ministry of Christ through our apostle. And so he visits however many churches he goes around and he finds out. <laughs> and this, is, this sounds like a horrible thing when you say it out loud. But that guy says, look, there ain't none of these preachers understand what God's doing today. I'll just stay home. I'm not going to sit under false doctrine. I'm not going to sit under bad doctrine. Spiritual man. Okay? I just got prompted I needed to throw that in there. All right? The carnal man, three men and a baby, the carnal man. The carnal man. We've talked about the natural man, we've talked about the spiritual man, now we're going to talk about the carnal man. Verse Chapter 3, the first three verses. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Who's Paul writing to? The church at Corinth. How many times have I told you if there's the church at Corinth is not the pattern <laughs> for a for a for a proper church. If, if any church could do it wrong, Corinth did. You don't go to Corinth to get, you don't go to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians to get a good example of how a, a healthy local church should function. You go to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians to find out how a healthy local church should not function. <laughs> the people of Corinth had a problem. 
And he says here in chapter 1, verse, or chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, I, brethren, could not speak unto you, you folks at Corinth, you believers in Corinth, you brethren at Corinth, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So what is carnal? Were these folks saved in Corinth? They weren't lost. These were not natural men. These were saved men. But they weren't spiritual men because they weren't spiritually maturing. They were carnal. They were saved, but they were carnal in the sense that they were spiritually handicapped. We use that term mentally handicapped. We're all of an age. We grew up with the term mentally retarded. Well, you know, we, we say we, we, we want to be PC to some degree. And so we don't want to offend. So in our conversation, as we go about our lives today in public, we would say mentally handicapped. But we really understand the term mentally retarded. Am I right? Because we know what retardation is. Retardation is that 10 year old who's still pooping their diaper. Retardation is that 15 year old that's still pooping their diaper. Retardation is that lack of mental development properly as it should have done. Right? That's mental retardation. Spirit, uh, mental handicap. They haven't matured. They haven't grown psychologically, mentally. They grow physically. I mean, my heart goes out to parents who have 40-year-old mentally handicapped children. That's a tough job. That's a tough job. And we've known, and you probably too, know people that have dealt with that and loved those kids. And, and, and I, you know, kids that they got a mind of an eight year old and they're 45. You know, my heart goes out to those folks. Well, the heart goes out to yourself when you're trying to care for some spiritually handicapped believer. Follow me where we're going with the thinking. So that's the carnal man. They're a babe. They're spiritually spiritually immature. We said that the we said that the the spiritual man judges all things. The carnal man doesn't know enough about Scripture to discern and judge all things. They get carried about with every wind of doctrine. They may have been saved and genuinely saved, genuinely know the Lord, but they're so ignorant of the Word of God, they, 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 they can't defend what they believe. Here, here's spiritual carnality. We say we believe a certain thing, but we cannot go to Scripture and prove it. That's spiritual carnality. Because if I say I believe a thing, and, and I've told this story many times, of one of my customers I used to go to, he was a young man about the age of my kids. Kids were coming up. He was a deacon in his local denominational church, and uh, he was involved with the youth department because his kids were in the youth department coming up and all this stuff. And and we, you know, I go to houses, and but people know I'm a preacher, and we look and we talk about Bible things and. He says, you know, Brother Sam, he says, I'm just having a tough time. He says, I watch and the kids come along. They seem to do real good in church and they go to camp and they participate in vacation Bible school and they seem to be doing real good. And then they get into high, junior high or maybe high school or even maybe they go off to college and they just completely fall away from the scripture. They completely fall away from anything to have to do with the church or the word of God or anything Bible. They just completely fall away from all that. He says, I'm just really struggling, trying to understand. I said, well, let me ask you a few questions. I knew what kind of church he goes to. And so I began to ask him some doctrinal questions. I said, do you, uh, you know, I said, if I, I said, and I started out with the gospel. I said, if I was a lost man and I came to you and said, would you be, would you, you know, I'm a lost man. I want to know how to go to heaven when I die. And I, and I asked him, in, where would you take me in scripture to show me the gospel? 
and I had that calf looking at a new gate on his face. Deer in the headlights look. And after an awkward moment, and, and I get this a lot, he said it with a question mark, John 3.16? Well, again, you stay where you learn. John 3.16 is not the gospel. People impose the gospel on John 3.16, but John 3.16 is not the gospel. So he said, John 3.16 with a question mark. And so I shared with him in Scripture, Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. That's the place you go to show someone, here's the gospel. And I asked him other questions. I said, do you believe in the eternal security of the believer? Well, I didn't use the right terminology. So he again looked at me like, what are you talking about? And then he said, oh, you mean once saved, always saved. And I said, yeah, that's what I mean. I believe the eternal security of the believer. Yeah, once saved, always. He said, oh, yeah, I believe that. I said, can you take me to one passage of Scripture to support what you believe? You know what? He couldn't do it. I asked him about the rapture of the church. Do you believe that in the church age, Trump is going to sound, Jesus is going to say, call up all those of us who have been saved by grace through faith and finished work of Christ. He's going to call us up and we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Do you believe that? Oh yeah, I believe that. I believe in the rapture. Show me one passage of scripture. Now I'm going to present to you. Good church-going man. I don't question his salvation. He gave a good testimony of salvation. But would you call that man a spiritual man or would you call that man a carnal man? He's a carnal man. Because he cannot defend from Scripture what he says he believes. And let the right person come along who can persuade him out of the Scriptures because he's not anchored in the book he can be carried away. Does that make sense? So we got so the spiritual man judges all things. The carnal man can't judge all things because he's not grounded in the scripture. The carnal man is judged of men. The spiritual man's not judged of men. The carnal man's judged as men. The carnal believer <laughs> lives a life thinking that if he pleases the preacher, he must be right with God. Amen or old me? That's the carnal man. If I live right, if the preacher's packing me on the back, if the preacher's calling on me to pray, if the preacher's asking me to take up the offering, if the preacher's letting me sing in the choir or calling me to sing a special, if the preacher's allowing me to, to uh, teach a Sunday school class, well then, uh, you know, I must be good to go. I'm spiritual. Don't know a thing about the Bible. Can't give a Bible answer for what you say you believe. But I dress right. I sing in the choir. And I teach the primary boys Sunday school class. My preacher thinks I'm a good guy. Don't y'all see how carnal that is? That's carnality. It's religion, but it's carnality. The carnal man doesn't have the mind of Christ. And the carnal man cannot feed on meat. You give the carnal man meat and they choke on it. So we got the carnal man, we got the spiritual man, we got the natural man. I'm going to go back to Hebrews 5 for a moment before I take it to the babe and wrap this up. I'll put ribbons in to try to help you today. Hebrews 5. I'm going to read 12, 13, 14 again. And, and and remember, Paul, or the writer, Paul's not the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews says, uh, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Carnal. For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers. That carnal churchgoer, they're saved, they've trusted Christ. That carnal churchgoer, can they teach a Sunday school class? Sure they can. But what are they doing? They're taking that denominational quarterly 
and they're studying the material that their denominational system provides for them, are they studying the Bible or are they studying the material? And is there a difference? Oh yeah, big difference. So the study of the material. They're not teaching the scriptures. They're teaching the quarterly. They're teaching the denominational literature. For when, the, for, when for the time you ought to be teachers. How many of but we got started a few minutes late. Why did we get started a few minutes late? Talking. What were we talking about? Horses. Talking about horses. This, for those on YouTube and, and Facebook Live, this is the Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries. We, we have horse people. And if they're not horse people, they're married to horse people. <laughs> We've got horse people here. And you know what? It's real easy for us to talk about horse stuff. Our minds are full of horse stuff. We can talk to you about trucks. We can talk to you about trailers. We can talk to you about saddles. We can talk to you about horseshoes or not horseshoes. We can talk to you about boots. We can talk to you about riding apparel and uh, riding clothes. And, and my wife got her her first pair of carrots the other day. Aww. For those of you who... <laughs> she found them online and got a bargain. And, and she got her first pair of carrots. Now, I know you folks out there won't have a clue what we're talking about. But these horse people do. And I'm kind of making my point with all that. And so we can talk about all that. We can talk about horse breeds. And, you know, I upset people because I say, you know, you're not riding a foxtrotter? I'm sorry. You know. <laughs> and so, you know, we talk about that. It comes real easy. The spiritual man who is maturing in the Word of God studying and reading and coming to some understandings of the truth of the Word of God, what do you think it ought to be really easy to, for them to find themselves talking about to other people? The Word of God. The truths of Scripture. Not just those generalities. I'm talking about the truth of Scripture. But he says there, verse 12 of Hebrews 5, for when, the, for, when for the time you ought to be teachers... Again, I'm not talking about necessarily standing up here, although that's a wonderful thing, and anybody who'd want to come along and, Brother Sam, I've got to listen, I'd like to teach. I'd like to talk about that. Man, get up here. We'll do it. I, man, that'd tickle me to death. But I'm talking about teachers, whether it's out on the trail, having a conversation with somebody when you ride, sitting around your dining room table, sitting around a fire, uh, in a, on you know a nice fall evening, wherever it may be in your life, and you're sharing the truth of the Word of God and things you've learned, the gospel and the rightly divided Word of Truth, you're being a teacher. Amen. I don't think I'll ever get Dewey Styles to stand behind this pulpit to teach or preach anything. But you can sit down with Dewey Styles and have a conversation with him, and you'll find out he's a teacher. He knows a thing or two. We'll talk about, he, he goes to these car shops and car lots and does his work. And he'll say, you know, I got in a conversation with this guy at such and such car lot, the Ford dealership, and here's what he said, and here's what I gave him. And, and what was he doing? He was being a teacher. For when the time, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, the, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become as such as have, meat, have need of milk and not of meat, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Read that again. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are of a full age, even though who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So when we talk about that carnal man, that's what we're talking about. Now, they ought to be teachers. They're shallow. You heard me talk about shallow churchianity. And churchianity is thousands of miles wide and an inch deep. Churchianity. Okay. All right, let's move on and finish this. 
Three men, the carnal man, the spiritual man, the natural man. And now we come to the babe. And so you're back there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. And we see that he makes a reference there in verse 1. I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, when a baby is a baby, is that okay? Y'all know I've been talking about it. We've just had our first great grandbaby a month ago, Monday, last Monday. And uh, uh, we can't wait. We're hoping the weather will hold in Wisconsin so we can go see face to face and hold in our own hands that first great grandbaby. Well, you know what? That grandbaby, you know what he's going to do when I'm holding him? He's going to put green stuff all in that diaper. And if he's been with mama for a few minutes and I pick him up and hold him and I put one of those diapers across my chest, across my shoulder and I pick him up and I pat him and walk around, you know what he's going to do? He's going to spit up all over me. <laughs> you know what? That's what babies do. I'm going to talk to him and he's going to look at me and he ain't going to understand a word I say. <laughs> he can't walk. He can't crawl. He, he might be able to roll over by the time I see him at Thanksgiving. He's already pretty active. That's natural. So a babe in Christ, somebody who's first come to faith in Christ, they're brand new, saved, new believers in Christ. They're going to make a mess of things. You can't expect them to know things. But you don't expect them to be babies. To, you know, excuse me, you don't expect them to continue to be babies. Eventually, you expect them to roll over. Eventually, you expect them to start crawling. Eventually, you expect them to move from milk to, you know, mushed up green beans. <laughs> and you expect them to move from that, you know, to mushed up meat of some kind. You know, mash up a hot dog or something. And then, you know, eventually by the time they're however old, you expect them to be able to eat a piece of steak. You may have to cut it for them for a while and give it to them bite size. They may not have enough discernment to know not to take too big a bite, so you cut it up for them, but yet they can eat meat. Y'all follow the, the analogy? Well, spiritually speaking, the same thing. Babes must be fed milk. Uh, 1 Peter, I'm going to read a verse out of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, I put a mark here. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So as newborn babes, they desire the sincere milk of the word. <laughs> you see those videos of those new babies and uh, you'll see another lady holding that baby and maybe that lady's well endowed and you see the videos and that baby's going you know because they don't see they see groceries <laughs> as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word as newborn babes, they're fed milk, but they desire the milk, and then they get in the word. Uh, as newborn babes, as Hebrews 5 says, they're unskillful in the word. But as they keep studying and keep learning and keep getting in the book, after a while, they're no longer unskillful. After a while, they become skillful. We protect babies, don't we? So we do the same thing with new babes, new believers in Christ. You want to protect them. Going off into bad doctrine and false doctrine and error, you want to protect them, and then they so they're unskillful in the word, and, and you they have to be protected, and, uh, and but they have to mature from the milk to the meat. Babies have to grow, otherwise they become carnal. Three men and a baby. So now we listen to this, and we come back, and we have to ask ourselves, well, which one am I? If you're the natural man and have never trusted Christ as your Savior, I mean, you've been religious or whatever, but there's never been that moment in time when you realized you were a sinner and you trusted Christ alone as your salvation, for your salvation. 
I say that for whoever might be here and whoever's listening out there. I say it like this a lot of times. Ask yourself the question or make the statement, I know I'm going to heaven because, and fill in the blank. There's only one right answer. I know I'm going to heaven because I walked the aisle, I had an emotional experience, I prayed a prayer, and I started living better. That's not salvation. That's reformation. I walked an aisle, I prayed a prayer, I was a terrible husband, I was a terrible mother, I was a terrible wife, I was a terrible dad, whatever it may be, and I made up my mind I was going to do better and start going to church and clean up my act and live right. And you know, it wasn't long and I was teaching a Sunday school class and it wasn't long and I was singing in the choir. Folks, that's not salvation. Salvation is, I know I'm going to haunt heaven because there was a day and a time and a place that I realized I was a sinner and I trusted Christ and what he did for my salvation. There's the answer. Amen. <clears throat> so, the natural man, the natural man has never come to that place. They may be educated out of it, they may think they're too far away from it, or they may think that they've earned it on their own. That's the natural man. The spiritual man getting in the book, growing and maturing. Start as a babe, get in the book and go from being unskillful to skillful. The carnal man, saved, but absolutely no, the, 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 the carnal because they have no spiritual maturity. They don't know anything about the book. They don't know anything about what they believe or why they believe. And then the, the babe, that's just the newborn babe in Christ. Just come to faith, just learn it. Each one of us are somewhere among those three men in a baby. I'll leave it between you and the Lord to evaluate where you are. Amen? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll sing our song and be dismissed. And uh, would you dismiss us, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity.